The engineer team behind Amazon Prime Video has released a blog detailing how they moved uh, one monitoring service that detects, you know, uh, freezing frames and clicks and audio in the live streaming portion in the Prime Video app. And they moved that piece of the architecture from serverless and microservices to a monolith. And they saved 90% of the cost and they were able to scale better. How about we read this article and then discuss? So this comes from Prime Video Tech, right? Uh, written by Marcin Kolny. Scaling up the Prime Video audio video monitoring service and reducing cost by 90%. The move from distributed microservices architecture to a monolith application helped achieve higher scale resilience and reduce cost. So yeah, so how did they actually move from microservices to monolith and how did that happen? Let's discuss this. Uh, I gotta warn you guys, uh, this article is not very detailed, unfortunately, right? Th there is a lot of missing things here. Uh, this article could have been great. It's it's just okay, to be honest, right? That's that's one, one thing out of the way. And, and the reason is because there's so much background information that we have no idea about the diagrams is, is not really well de uh, designed in my opinion and the, the 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 text doesn't explain the architecture well it's just it's just a bunch of boxes and they talk to each other and we have no idea what the use case is what's the workflow like what is what am i doing here as a customer the, all of these things are missing right maybe they are explained in, in other places i looked in other articles it's not there but i'll try based on my understanding to actually explain what i think is happening right of course i might be wrong right? but let's get it prime video a prime amazon prime if you don't know this is a service you pay what 120 dollar a year you get so many stuff like two-day delivery from amazon prime video prime music so much services right so you can also subscribe with Twitch, you know, to support your creators. Prime is something almost all, you know, people in the U.S. have, right? even even outside as well. So Prime is a very popular concept, right? So a Prime Video, we offer thousands of live streams to our customers. Live streams here has nothing to do with Twitch, by the way. This is their own new thing, apparently, that, you know, to live stream sporting events, you know? and having you watch it on this app that's called Prime Video. So don't confuse that with Twitch. It, I, I don't think it has anything to do with Twitch because I, I first like live streaming, isn't that Twitch? Because Twitch is owned by Amazon. So that's why it first went, but nothing to do with Twitch. They're, they're apparently working and from the, these articles that you see on the side, it's like always like this streaming thing, they're trying to pop, promote it because that's their, you know, the, the better version of Twitch, if you will, the, the actual high quality streaming, and they are spending m good money when it comes to here, right? That's what I noticed. So to ensure that customers seemingly, seeming, seamlessly receive content. So if, I, my, if I'm a prime paying customer, unlike Twitch, which is free, anyone can go, go and watch it. You know, this is actually payment. So if you're paying something, it better be good. So they are spending, they have an architecture to detect, right? So just to summarize this article, uh, maybe let's do that. Like, yeah, they have, an, they have an architecture to monitor and detect the experience of the user. Right? So because if the experience of the user on a, on a PS5 watching a live stream versus on an iPhone versus on an Xbox versus on an Android phone is all different. And the reason is because the device does the decoding i suppose of the video and the audio and and it takes these packets and there's a client side logic that executes and does more work and it could be there is there is a bug in the decoder or the encoder that re that shows you this uh freeze you know frames or or something it clicks in the audio so there's a bug there in the client app and amazon wants to detect those bugs in the client apps that's my understanding there's also of course it could be the encoder that the data you receive based on what whatever streaming platform you are in 
whether it's good, better quality, like the low, I think that's how they categorize it. Good, better, or best, something like that. That's how they categorize it. So based on those streaming qualities and bit rates, they, they could have problems in those as well, in the source themselves. So I don't know if that is being uh, detected by this, right? But in general, maybe both actually. So if if I am actually monitoring my device, what what I think this tool does, what I think, because they don't say that, the client application actually, once it decodes that, and I see it, right? There is an option where you can set up monitoring. I didn't see it in my app here, but maybe there is a place that I didn't see. Look, when you enable this monitoring thing, it will re-upload the stream or part of the stream that you just watched back to Amazon as as it is as you decoded it. So it's as how you watched it is Amazon will see it. That's the only way that you can actually ensure that whatever the user seen is uploaded back, right? Because the client's doing more work. So this uploading thing back to this architecture that we're going to discuss, then goes into the steps that we're going to, that, that they are optimizing. It goes into a microservice architecture. There's a media conversion, it converts the stream that the user just uploaded, the, the application that just uploaded to a bunch of frames, right, which is images, and the audio is converted into certain buffers, certain, you know, uh, 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 bytes, and those are fed into something called the detector, service another microservice how we're going to talk about that and then once the detector will use machine learning based on training data that says okay oh i detect these these frames are actually frozen and these audios are actually clicking so it will once it detects something it will issue uh, a notification to a service and it will write down that okay this portion this frame is bad this portion this the frame is is not good, right? And we'll detect those. So that's how monitoring works. So now that we understand that, let's continue on reading and discussing the distributed architecture of that that I want to just explain versus the monolith version. Right? Let's go ahead. Our video quality team at Prime Video already owned a tool for audio video quality inspection. Right? So a quality inspection, we're inspecting the quality, but we never intended it nor designed it to run at high scale, which is understandable. When you first design something, they never thought about it, you know, it's to, to actually serve thousands of concurrent streams, right? Thousands of concurrent streams. And we're talking about, are we, and here's what, what I, another thing I didn't understand. What is concurrent streams, right? We're monitoring concurrent streams back from the customers, right? The customers watching something, right? And it's downloading it. Then it turns around and upload that part of the stream to the, to the service. And the reason I'm saying this is because that's exactly what the diagram is showing, right? The diagram is actually showing the user, the customer is actually uploading something. It's not a direct and the reason is the cust you want the customer to upload which makes also more more sense is because the the decoding happening of the device and and if there's a bug in the client application you want to detect that after the decoding so whatever so i have no idea how much bandwidth that takes when it comes to the upload again guys i might be way off here but again this article is not details enough so i have no idea that like, if I'm, if I'm saying is actually correct or not. But yeah, so these concurrent streams are being monitored. While onboarding more streams to the service, we noticed that running the infrastructure was high scale, was very expensive. So they, they, the more streams they start to onboard, I suppose, the more customers they're starting to monitor their experience. That's my guess, at least. Uh, that's where they saw the bottlenecks. The initial version they did was uh, a service consisted of distributed components that were orchestrated by step functions, AWS step function, which is, I think this is their Lambda. The two expensive operations were the orchestration workflow and the data passed 
bet- uh, when, and when the data pass between distributed comp- components. Because now you're, you're having these de- decoded frames and you're passing it around between microservices, of course it's gonna be slow, right? To address this, we moved all components to a single process to keep the data transfer within the process memory, right? which also simplified the orchestration logic because we compiled all operations into a single process. So that's what they did. They moved everything from microservices down to a single process. And once you do that, all the single process have is the heap memory, right? So you can store these frames into the heap and uh, just access them. It doesn't get any faster, right? Distributed system over it. So here's where we go into the details. One, our service consists of three major components. Three major components. The media converter converts input audio video streams to frames or decrypted audio buffers that are sent to detectors. So that's the first thing, media converter. How the media converter got the data, they don't explain, but they're, but they're, but their diagram does. Their diagram has this customer, which is a very bad name to, to label something. Why did you call it? It should be called the client application. Right? It's just, to me, the cust- if you say customer, it, I don't know, it's not clear to me, like, what is this? You have to be the client app, the prime video client app, right? I don't know. It might be, I might be, like, over exaggerating here but but see you see the arrow audio video stream where is the arrow going arrow is going from the customer to the media conversion service like if you're watching something you're gonna watch it from the source down right so the the customer is actually consuming the stream but here the customer is actually uploading something and that's where they something they never mention here there is a monitoring concept here. And I think the app itself have this feature where you can opt in maybe in the app on any platform to monitor your stream, the quality of your stream. And if that happens, you the app will periodically probably sample your stream and upload. Of course, not going to upload everything. Hope not. <laughs> right back to the media conversion service that we just talked about. This media conversion service will take that raw stream it's not really raw it's the converted stream on your app it's as if it's whatever you saw and again anything i say here is just my assumption because it's not it's not it's not uh, stated in the article and so anything i say here is just my assumption and i could be wrong so now the stream is received by the media service it's being converted into the frames and the audio decrypted audio buffers now what they said is like now they are sent to the detectors. How do they, the, they are sent to the detectors? To send it to the detectors, they are actually writing it to an S3 bucket. Why? And the reason is because there is another process that the customer effect uh, essentially triggered to say, okay, start monitoring now. There's this arrow that is not labeled here. But I think from the other from the other diagram, I kind of deduce it's called start analysis. I think that's what it is. So they, there is a thing that's called, okay, start analysis, which calls this lambda function, which then starts the conversion. Because when when you upload, when the customer uploads this, it doesn't really d- start the conversion, it just stores it locally, apparently here. And then this arrow, this explicit client app actually says, okay, now let's convert. I don't know why it's like that, right? Now it's gonna convert this, and then we'll store it. The moment we store this, this is now that's the orchestration part. It's like, okay, well, now it's, you go go ahead and convert. Now let's wait. Oh, did you did you convert? Like it has to be you. you the media conversion has to send back something, and it's not it's not in the diagram, of course, right? So it's like, okay, I'm acknowledging. I just did the conversion. Or maybe this is done asynchronously, right? Once it's done the lambda will now code and says okay hey detector go read from the s3 bucket uh, whatever the media conversion wrote those frames and these uh, decrypted buffers the audio buffers and then run your beautiful machine ai thingy 
right? And let's just do the thing. And once you have the results, go and write it to the notification service. Now, who's going to read the notification service? Probably the customer. But as a customer, why do I care to see the, that my f f f uh, my frame uh, froze? It's like, I want you guys to fix it. Not like this. So this notification is like for, for Amazon, not for me as a customer. So I don't, I don't understand why it's called Amazon. It's in its customer's real time notification topic. I don't care if your frame froze, right? I saw it freezing. I know it's freezing. So why would you tell me? I don't know. The whole thing is just, I don't know. There is so much missing thing. And maybe I'm missing one component that it will make everything make sense. But part of this doesn't. And there is, of course, there is another uh, result aggregation uh, function that collects this as well and writes this aggregation to another S3 bucket. And if you, if you want to learn more, uh, there is another article describing this machine learning thing. It's right here. So now they, they, they talk about the problems. We design our initial uh, solution as a distributed system using serverless, right? And the whole thing is almost all of this uh, serverless, it's, except this media service conversion they didn't say what that is yeah. however the way we use the sum components causes to hit a hard scaling limit at five percent of the expected load so they couldn't scale past that they just hit that so of course there is a there is a bottleneck here right the main scaling bottleneck in this architecture was the orchestration management that was implemented using AWS function Right? Because this this thing like okay start conversion and then customers trigger this and then now you go read this and now you do that and now you aggregate, that's the orchestration that's the expensive part because right? there is always a delay like when do you know when to actually orchestrate, like do you do it synchronously do you, do you have a timer do you do it asynchronously it's just interesting, our service performed multiple state transitions for every second of stream that I. That I didn't understand exactly what, like what is the state transitions? Maybe it's an AWS thing that I don't know about. So we um, we quickly reached our account limit. Beside that, AWS function charges users per state transitions. It's like ooh, here's the third thing: Why are you charging me for something you're responsible for with? I don't know, guys. I still don't know what the heck is this. It's like, why? Why would I care? It's like, it's like you, you're responsible for Prime Video, not me. Why are you charging me for your serverless? Like, charges user. I think it's just the the way it's written is just is it's it's weird. It's just the way it's written. It's like. It's like an engineer actually writing, and and we're treating us like users. You know, it's not it's not written as a as a product. Does that make sense? It's written as an actual engineer uh, trying to explain the problem. Although the the engineering piece is is actually belong to them. Does it make sense? The co the second cost problem what we discovered was about the way we were passing video frames images around the different components to reduce computationally expensive video conversion jobs we built a microservice that splits videos into frame and temporarily upload images to uh, this s3 right that's, that's the way they did and the reason is uh, they don't they want to reduce the conversion jobs right so they they convert it once and then distribute images and instead of having and that's that's this service, the media conversion. And instead of passing the audio stream directly to this, because it's going to be expensive for the compute unit to actually convert and analyze, as opposed, so that, that, that kind of makes sense. I, I'm, I'm with them on this. It's a good idea to convert it. It's not a good idea to put the output in an S3 bucket, to my in my opinion. Um, they could have at least, instead of writing that to a S3 bucket and then reading it. It's like a, you're incurring the cost of a write. You're incurring the cost of a network, right? Bandwidth, because that's not in the same machine, right? And then you're incurring another cost to a write. And that's another I.O. And then there is another cost of the network. So why all this stuff? And there is, these, are, these frames are not small. They are huge, right? So even if you like have, let's say this is HTTP, and you're going to have HTTP2 compression, right? So uh, GZIP or whatever, then, 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 then still, 
these are really large things. You're downloading and uploading and downloading and uploading. The, so they hit their limit even in this three. I, it always like it is odd the way they're talking about this. Like they own the product, but they're talking about S3 and Amazon as if it's like something else. Does that make sense? It's just odd. I know, I know. Yeah, so uh what what else? What else? So one thing, just just look at this diagram. Like forget about the monolith. You could have eliminated this by just having the media conversion talk directly to the S3, to the to the detector. Like have a serverless function that takes the frames as an input. So have the media conversion once it's upload, both immediately uh go ahead and upload this way you can kill technically you can kill the start conversion and you can kill this orchestration altogether you don't need orchestration because once the video is uploaded the media conversion will have the result and it will uh, buffer it in memory and then once it have it it will upload it to the to call this uh, serverless uh, lambda function and says hey here's a frames go and detect them right and this will just scale, right? Because it's just a scalable function. So this way you don't even need the S3. So I don't know why they didn't do it this way, for example. That's just one way to do it, I suppose. Okay. So it was expensive to write to S3, right? Again, I speak here now like an armchair architect, of course, right? But I am not in the in the midst of this. There is so much missing things here. So you, we have no idea what's behind this could be a way more complex process that doesn't allow the, what I just mentioned here. But okay, okay, they said, okay, uh, microservice is bad. Uh, just, just bleh. More, give me monolith, please. Give me beautiful monolith. Yeah. So what they said, okay, to address the bottleneck, they said, all right, let's fix everything. Let's put everything. They made the bold decision to, to re-architect. What they did, they basically... Everything is the same, right? It's just they put everything in a single process. So they're still talking to this orchestration layer, which I still think it's unnecessary, to be honest. Right? But they have this orchestration. So it's okay, now let's go ahead and start analysis. But still, see, the, the user still uploads the stream from their client app to this media converter. Like there's, so there is an endpoint here that allows you to upload stuff. And this ECS task, what's the difference between an ECS VM and an ECS task? Is those two different thing? I don't know. Maybe they are. But that, that whole thing is just one beautiful process. Right? And these are the components. So they put everything in the same thing. So now, when, when you call start analysis, it will call start conversion. And then it will convert everything that has been uploaded by the user. So start conversion. And then upload the new buffers, uploading it somewhere here. New audio buffer. Why is it going back to the orchestration? I think that's... Oh, I know. So that... What is the dotted line? I suppose the dotted line is the content. That's what I understand, seems like. Right? And this solid lines are the response and requests. It's okay. Hey, I have a new buffer. See, for example, why you guys you didn't do this? Why is it not here? Why is it not complete? That is so sloppy. I'm sorry. It's so sloppy. It's like, I, yeah, this is Amazon tech we're talking about. This is Amazon. You got to produce some good piece of content, guys. This is not acceptable, right? So, yeah, if you did, then there is like, so I called it. I saw it's like, oh, there, there must be something coming back here as an acknowledgement. Here, they show it right okay let's go now new audio video boom good and now the orchestration here the next step to kick sense is all right now let's analyze what we have but but what did the media conversion did they also write in memory it wrote these frames and the decrypted audio in memory beautiful because in memory it's a it's in this process heap right so this is assuming this is just a single process even it has it, it can be a different process that's fine but then this instant memory could, could be a shared memory pool, right? And then multiple processes can access that. That's fine. It still is fast, right? So in that case, the, whether the detection is a different process or not, it doesn't matter. It's still the whole thing is in the single machine. 
So we still have access to the memory, direct hot memory access, right? And we don't care about persistent. So if we lose this, if we crash, who cares? We don't care about durability, right? Like this is their, this is not one of their goals to like, okay, oh, I crashed. Sure, we lose it. And that's fine, I think. Right? Because it, it's fine to lose the work. For, it's a monitoring service. It's not like a serious thing that you need to persist, right? So that's fine if you do it in uh, ephemerally. So yeah, we have this detector one, detector two, right? And, and then detection goes off, and then we write the detection results, and then uh, notify people, and then still we're writing the aggregation final output to an S3 bucket. Cool. So conceptually, the high-level architecture rem remain the same, they they didn't change that's why they they wanted to keep the orchestration just because they do they want to they don't want to change the code a lot because the orchestration is still there they, they just change the how the orchestration is talking to each other by making it local calls effectively right and then uh if the, so all the components are still there In the initial design we could scale several detectors horizontally right why because it's just it's another uh, serverless function, right? As each of them are in separate microservice, right? And they can just spin up. Here, they cannot, right? Because, well, I can argue that you still can. If you do the detection as a, as a different process, you can. But the problem is like you're limited by the compute power on that thing, right? Which is still, I guess that's fine as well, right? Like, then they, 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 the problem is that now they, that box is reaching its limit, right? Let's say you spin up even one or multiple processes. I think that's what they're doing. They're spinning up multiple processes, which is each detector is a process or a thread, whatever. But then the... So yeah, that's what they're doing, right? So so each detector, I think, is its own process. That I wish they talked about this. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. I really, I wish, I, I wish, I wish, I wish that these details are explained. This This block could have been great but it's just okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's like, why don't you explain that? Oh, we now, every detector is now a process or every detector is a thread. Why not? Why not? Right? So, okay. Whatever. Whatever. Okay. I, I apologize, but sometimes like these things, it hurts my heart because this is a really good piece of work they put there, but the blog doesn't do it as justice, I think. It really doesn't do it as justice. Um, anyway. Anyway, in the initial designs, we could scale several detectors horizontally as each of them is, okay, we talked about that. So what did you guys do? Yeah. Uh, however, in our approach, the number of detectors only scale vertically because they all run on the same instance. Vertically. Yeah. Because that's just the same instance. I, I suppose these detectors are processes in this case. Our team regular regularly add more detectors to the service and we already exceeded the capacity of the single instance again they don't explain what the detectors is i'm assuming it's a processes uh, to overcome this problem we cloned the service multiple times parameterizing each copy with a different subset of detectors so it's a very simple thing the whole ecs cluster now its own thing so there is an ecs machine with everything right i think so right at least right part of the things has been cloned right as a group so it's still everything is talking to each other it's just they added another layer on top uh to to orchestrate to for to load balance the okay, forward request to to uh, to forward the request so think of these box these clusters is this whole thing right is that that orange box everything now becomes there and now if you you just horizontally scale that so now this, here is where microservices win in that particular case uh, they they effectively did macro services if you will right? macro not micro macro services just grouped everything and that's the perfect solution for this right in that particular case because all of these things that tightly talk to each other let's put them in one monolith right that makes sense because these guys talk to each other there's no point to separate them Right? If they are if they are very coupled, you need to put put them together. 
or somehow destroy the coupling if you can. So there's uh, two detectors here. There's three detectors in this case, right? And then uh, they just, uh, you load balance the whole thing. Okay. Before I forget and go, go through the final piece, uh, I think here's what I think will break in the future. Currently, there is only one consumer, if you will, for these uh, converted frames. And these are the these detectors, right? Uh, I think if there is another set of detectors that ne need to be added, uh, it's going to be interesting. I don't know how they're going to do that. Right? The only place where this detector should live is in this big monolith. And that's the cost that they will have to incur, right? That's where Kafka and, 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 and other, you know, pop subsystems come in handy, right? Unfortunately, that's, that's what will happen in that particular case, where that media conversion, if there will be more consumers for these decrypted audio and these frame images, other than the detector, then it will it will be interesting because they have to put these detectors these new detector types will have to to be lived in this whole cluster and the only way to scale is to scale the whole thing right although the media conversion doesn't need it to be scale you had to scale it you had to incur the cost of putting it in a cluster putting it in the process that is the selling point of microservices in that particular case uh, we where we see these these two components right what they did is like initially they, that's what they thought about so, okay media conversion uh, put in a, um, its own microservice this thing put in another microservice but then if one scales more than the other let's say the media conversion is not much right or i want to scale the media conversion service more versus the detection service uh, you don't get a choice you have to scale them both and that might be fine right? and that might be fine it's just in the future if you want to add more uh it's going to become interesting to see like what will happen right? the only way is just to add another type of detector in these instances so that's something i actually uh, i'm interested in to think more about Results and takeaway. Microservices and serverless components are tools that do work at high scale, but whether to use them over month has to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. I have to agree with that. State me 100%. It's all case-by-case -case basis. It all depends on what you're trying to do. Moving it, our services to a month reduce our infrastructure cost by 90%. Yeah. And that because uh, everything is now simpler. Now there is no more these... Uh, the, the, the S3s is was was killing them to be honest, right? And the bandwidth here, and the and the orchestration cost, right? All of the thing is now a single process, or maybe a multiple processes, right? Depends on what whatever that is. So it also increased our scaling capabilities. Today we're able to handle thousands of streams, and we still we we still have capacity to scale the service even further. Moving the solution to e Amazon EC2 allows us to use the compute saving plans that will help reduce costs down even further. Some decisions we've, uh, we've taken are not obvious, but they resulted in significant improvements. For example, we've replicated a computationally expensive media conversion process and placed it closer to the detectors. Whereas running media conversion once and caching it outcome uh, caching its outcome might be considered to be a cheaper option we found that this is not cost effective because that, that's what i just said right this is very interesting because they they rather recompute the because they were thinking about like let's let's make a media conversion and let's cache it but apparently that didn't work for them so it's just interesting to, it's an interesting use case in, indeed the changes we've made allow prime to monitor all streams viewed by our customers not just the ones with the highest number of viewers this approach results in even higher quality okay so that's interesting right so this actually proves that they're actually monitoring the 
streams viewed by our customers just that again that statement is still i'm not clear about right are we monitoring the raw stream that is that is being produced or are we monitoring how the stream is being consumed by the by the customer that that's that's a step that i'm not clear about yet all right guys uh, that's it for me today hope you enjoyed this video and what do you think about this uh, let me know in the comment section below see you in the next one goodbye